brief overview of qualitative research and CQR specifically. And my students here, Marquette, know me as, as sort of the, um, an acronym maniac here, so um, I'll, I'll try to at least the first time through explain what the various acronyms mean here. But QR is obviously qualitative research, CQR is consensual qualitative research. So in the brief overview, I just want to talk about just general background, purpose, and uses of, of qualitative research, and then also some process and steps. And then um, I'm hoping to, to uh, not only, as I say to my students, don't just tell, but also show, um, to give you some examples of CQR, um, looking specifically at the interview protocol and also at the data analysis. All right. So looking first at just a qualitative research overall, um, the uses, the purposes, the utility, things like that. Typically, qualitative research is used to describe and interpret complex phenomena within their context. Um, and the, the context word here is probably one of the more important words of this particular sentence, um, in that the context in qualitative research is hugely important. Um, and it really needs to be factored in. And, and as a researcher, um, you really need to sort of unpack that a little bit from your participants. Um, the other important words in this statement here are describe and interpret. We're not measuring. Um, sometimes we count, but that's not really the thrust of what we're doing. We're really trying to open up phenomena, understand them, describe them, make sense of them. Qualitative research also is uh, ideographic rather than nomothetic. And by that, we really, in qualitative research, we really try to understand in great detail, in tremendous depth, the experiences of, of a few participants as opposed to um, what typically what more quantitative research does is to seek more uh, generalization, universal truths and patterns in that way. The, mean, the method, the means of qualitative research often relies on open-ended research questions. Um, in CQR, many of those questions are sort of planned out or scripted ahead of time, but not all. Um, but, there, but the purpose here really is on the open-ended nature in that you're not, and I'll get to some examples later on, but really that they're, they're exploratory. You're trying to get your participants to provide you with lots of rich data. Another thing that qualitative research does um, is it really examines areas in which there often is not much existing research, um, either quant or qual. Um, there are areas that really just people haven't investigated quite yet. And so qualitative research is a very good and very effective means to, to again, open up those phenomena and try to understand um, what might be happening there. In qualitative research, there's always a cycling between uh, the inductive process of generating themes, categories, understandings of the data. Um, and then also always going back to the original data, whether that's you know, the raw data from the interview or whether that's the raw data in a transcription, whatever that might be. Um, so there's, there's constantly cycling back between what meanings, what understandings am I making of these data, and then grounding those, uh, grounding those interpretations, those meanings, understandings in the, in the raw data themselves. Uh, some of the early call approaches uh, that appeared in psychology and in PT stands for psychotherapy uh, research. GT, grounded theory uh, of Strauss and Corbin. Um, phenomenological approaches, Georgie is a big name there. Comprehensive process analysis, Robert Elliott. Um, so that's sort of some of the earlier pri early presence of qualitative research in psychotherapy. And I focus on those three because CQR actually integrates some fe features of each of those. So shifting now specifically to CQR, what are some of the key components of this particular method? Well, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the data analysis is indeed inductive from the bottom up as opposed to more um, deductive uh, top-down types of data analysis. And what I mean by that is we really try to describe a phenomenon and draw conclusions based on gathering rich, detailed, juicy data. Um, we allow the results to emerge from the data in, uh, and do not impose theoretical constructs on those data. For example, um, in studies looking at TSD as therapist self-disclosure, CSD as client self-disclosure. So if you're doing a study on TSD, um, a question you would not ask is um, of a participant, let's say you're looking at your interviewing therapists, um, a question you would not ask is, OK, so how did your disclosure lead to client insight, for example? Or did, how did it lead to client self-disclosure? That would be a, a very narrowing, um, foc too focused a type of question. Instead, you would ask something like, well, tell me how your clients responded to the therapist self-disclosure, which leaves it much more open, much more um, opportunity for the participants to respond in whatever way, um, as opposed to just prematurely foreclosing them to talk about insight, for example. 
Uh, in qualitative research, we also use research questions, not hypotheses, again, to reflect the more open nature of, of this particular method. Uh, CQR um, usually, but not always, relies on interviews. Usually they're telephone interviews, um, but there have been studies that have used face-to-face um, -face interviews, and there have been studies that have actually even used um, web-based um, interactions between researcher and participants. But the vast majority of CQR studies have used telephone interviews. Um, and in these interviews, you really do allow your participants to talk quite openly. Um, you don't constrain them through some of the constraints that are inherent in quantitative measures. Um, for example, I'm currently involved in a study uh, looking at how do therapists use humor in therapy. And one of the questions is, just as it says here, how do you use humor in therapy? So we're not necessarily asking, how do you use humor to do X, Y, or Z? It's a matter of just very openly, broadly saying, tell us a little bit about how you use it. And we let the participants respond in terms of you know, their own purposes and functions for using humor. As another example, um, so I did a study earlier on internal representations. That's what the IR stands for here. T stands for therapist. SR stands for supervisor. Um, and in that study, we looked at what types of internal representations of your therapist or your supervisor do you experience? So again, an open question in contrast to asking, you know, um, sort of, you know, um, how did your verbal representation of your supervisor, for example, affect you? That would foreclose the idea that we're only looking at verbal representations. Um, so again, the whole point is to have very open-ended, broad types of questions, focused enough so that they're related to your main topic, but not in a way that constrains participants to respond in a very, in a prematurely narrowed way. Additional key components of CQR, uh, the data, as it probably is becoming apparent, the data here are words, not numbers. Uh, we really are seeking a very full, rich description of an experience or a phenomenon. And our task as a researcher is to try to understand what participants mean by those words. Um, and to really, I keep using this phrase, unpack, but really to sort of open up, you know, even if you're both native English, speech or English speakers, there may be differences and important nuances to really investigate. So there's lots of following up questions, lots of additional probes to make sure that you as the researcher are really um, as accurately and as completely as possible capturing the participant's experience. Um, so you'll use follow-up questions to reflect, to paraphrase what the participant said, to ensure that the researcher understands. Um, and often when I'm doing interviews, I'll say to a participant, you know, I know you've already you, you've talked through this before, but I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Here's what I'm gleaning. And so I'll paraphrase back and make sure that my understanding matches what the participant was trying to communicate. As I mentioned earlier, the context is indeed vital here. Um, the researcher needs to remain immersed in everything that the participant says in order to, again, achieve that rich understanding of the participant's words. Um, so when, we, when you do the data analysis, and I'll talk about this later on, but really it's important to read or listen to the entire case before you even begin coding the data to get a sense of the context of the whole. So that once you're down, once you actually are doing some of the more um, detailed parts of the data analysis, you have that rich context of the whole case to inform your more specific analysis. Um, and the context also illuminates how the participant views the world. So what, what context, what background are they coming from as they're talking about their particular experience? Um, in an earlier study, for example, um, AR here stands for advising relationship. We were asking um, students about um, their advising relationship, particularly as it related to the dissertation process. And one of the students, um, and this is a direct quote from what the student said, uh, the student said that um, his her advisor told the student that the student would have to literally walk across the burning sands of hell before that student was allowed to defend the dissertation. So that provided very important context for us as we, not only as we continue to interview that particular participant, but as we understood what that participant had to say about um, the dissertation experience and about the advising relationship. So that's you know, a real um, rich example of the importance of context, because that certainly informed our understanding of the participant's experience. More key components of CQR. Um, typically, the samples, in comparison to quantitative research, they're fairly small, um, but you know, not, not well, typically the samples are in about uh, the 8 to 15 range. Um, and work I do, I try to get usually at least 12 or so, but I have done studies with, with fewer than that. But you look for a sample of about 8 to 15. Um, that may seem small, but actually you have a huge supply of data. If you're doing good, solid, rich interviews, uh, those 8 to 15 folks are going to yield a whole lot of data. 
Um, so the smaller samples then are, are actually feasible. Um, beyond you know, 15, I've, the largest study I've done I think maybe had 19. Um, beyond that, in order to do the rich data analysis, that gets a little bit unwieldy there. So 8 to 15 usually is, is sufficient. Again, we're looking for depth rather than breadth, digging in, getting a real uh, deep um, excavating experience of um, uh, ex excavating the data. Um, the other uh, element of the sample is you want the participants to have experienced the phenomenon of interest and you want them to be able to speak articulately about that experience. Um, one of the studies we did a couple years ago was on uh, international students' uh, experiences of being an international student. And we needed to be very mindful that not everybody's first language was going to be English. So that was something we needed to, to bear in mind as we did the interviews and as we analyzed the data. So language is important. Um, some qualitative or some CQR has, has worked with kids as participants. And again, you've got to be uh, mindful of what level, to what level of, of verbal ability do they have, how articulate are they, things like that. And if you're working with folks who may be um, verbally or cognitively compromised in some way, that needs to, to weigh into your decisions about how you approach uh, the interview as well. Um, but absolutely, the participants must have experienced the phenomenon of interest um, and to, the, to a greater, the greatest degree possibly able to speak fully um, and quite fluently about that experience. With CQR, uh, the C part of C is the consensual piece. Uh, so in CQR, we by default have multiple perspectives. Um, and that's you know, something that helps us bring in our bias. If you've got three people or so on a primary team, you have three different perspectives, three different ways uh, of understanding the data, three different sets of lenses that are looking at those data. Um, so the multiple perspective really allows us to, to rein in that bias that each of us just by definition of being human brings to our understanding of the data. Um, we also use a team of judges to analyze those data uh, because POVs is point of views. Different point of views will emerge, um, and, that'll, and the, having multiple people on the team allows us really to challenge each other's understanding of the data uh, and encourage each of us to think about the data in new ways. Um, we try to, to, to not have a whole lot of groupthink going on, so we really you know, talk openly um, and freely about, you know, I, I really understood this section in a very different way. Let's kind of talk about how each of us is coming to our individual understanding. I mean, eventually, and eventually reaching consensus on how collectively the primary team understands the data. And that then leads to um, another element of the multiple, multiple perspectives are the group dynamics on the team. Um, as you're constructing your team, you've got to be very um, thoughtful about who, how that team works together and who would be a good, um, good folks to constitute the theme. Um, often we, we try to have a combination of researchers and practitioners. Um, or we often will have um, both faculty and students on the team. And given the different experiential levels and worlds there, um, given the different sort of emphases of, of um, where they're working professionally, it's really important early on in the process that the team sit down and talk face-to-face, -face, if at all possible, if not certainly via the phone, about, about some potential power dynamics there. If you've got faculty and students, um, there's an inherent power difference there, and so it's really important that the faculty and the students sort of talk that through. Um, and I, as a faculty member, try um, not to be the one who's always leading the meetings or who's always leading the data analysis, whether we rotate turns or whether we just sort of let that happen spontaneously. But having an open conversation about um, the team constitution and about any of the, of the dynamics between team members is a really vital part of the process. Um, as you're sort of processing the process, um, it's not unusual at all to, you know, to get through the data or to get into the data analysis a bit and kind of step back and say, so how are we working as a team? Um, you know, is everyone feeling open and, and able to uh, communicate openly and freely? Um, so really just sort of open up that type of a conversation as well. The last piece then of the group dynamics is uh, the fact that you have auditors who, who will check the team's work. They check the data analysis all the way through, um, and they and then introduce yet another perspective, another point of view. So there's constantly you know, a challenging of um, the initial in interpretation, initial understanding of the data through the primary team itself and then also through the auditors who were not part of the primary team but still integral to the study. Okay, as I've alluded to earlier, uh, consensus is a huge component here of CQR. Um, and what I'm now talking here is about uh, how consensus uh, works, how it's used in the data analysis piece. Um, and let's say, uh, hypothetically, we're working with a, a three-person primary data analysis team here. Um, 
what would happen if you've got a, you, you have your interviews have been done, you've had them transcribed. Um, each member of the primary team would first examine the data independently. So you go off on your own, you examine the data on your own, and then you come back together in a meeting and you discuss your emerging understanding of those data as a team. And I'll talk more specifically about the various data analysis steps, what that looks like, but that's sort of the overall picture here. Your goal is to collectively, by consensus, to agree on the best representation or the best understanding of the data. As you do that, you want to make sure you, you capture the complexity of the data um, by integrating all the team members' perspectives. Um, and you, you certainly don't want one person to be dominating the data analysis. And again, that goes back to what I was talking about, the power dynamics and the team constitution. The researchers must be able to um, state their point of view, must be able to openly discuss and engage in disagreement respectfully, um, and eventually reach consensus. Um, so again, as I mentioned, the mutual respect, the equal involvement, shared power is a key part of the process here. Um, every once in a while, you'll get some funky dynamics on a team, and what you've got to do is just sort of talk through that, figure out what's going on, what's leading to the funkiness, and, and try to work through that. Um, which then leads to the last point there that trustworthiness, uh, trustworthiness uh, and credibility really hinge vitally on this consensus process. Um, so again, speaking to the egalitarian nature of it, everybody having an equal voice, everyone feeling free to contribute, and everyone's contributions being equally valued and equally respected. Um, there is a, a, a bit about internal triangulation there on the team. Again, you have everyone sort of checking everyone else's uh, understanding of the data versus a single researcher, um, which would not occur in CQR because that would sort of get rid of the whole C piece, the consensus piece. So you have lots of checks and balances within the primary team itself, and that then is augmented when you go to the auditors outside the primary team, too. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you are continually returning to the data. Um, as you're beginning to understand uh, the data, as you're beginning to uh, domain or come up with core ideas or the cost analysis, you're always returning back to the original data, sometimes as far back as the original interview, um, or it could be you're returning to the transcript or to or, you know, the core ideas, things like that. And again, that's an effort to check for the trustworthiness of your emerging findings. Um, and, and there may be times, again, when you have to return to the participants' actual words to address areas where there's disagreement or there's confusion. Um, I was in a research team meeting actually literally this morning, and, and they said, you know, we really need to go re-listen to this part of the interview to make sure we're understanding what the participants said. And that is a, a common process um, as you're going through the data analysis here. Um, to constantly go back to the raw data to make sure that your understanding is indeed accurately reflecting those data. Okay, in terms of uh, the applicability of qualitative research or CQR, um, when I'm, I'm teaching a class right now on qualitative research, and what I tell my students is your research questions should um, determine your method, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Um, so you, you need to figure out what are your most compelling research questions? You know, what do you want to find out about this phenomenon? And that should determine your qualitative method. Some questions are best answered via quantitative types of designs, comparing effects of the different therapy approaches, for example. Some questions are better answered through qualitative designs. And I sort of talked earlier on in an earlier slide about you know, what are the types of questions or the, or the, uh, the, types, yeah, the types of questions that might lead themselves well to qualitative research. More specifically, um, if your research questions really are, are predicated upon deeply examining the inner experience of a phenomena, attitudes, beliefs, views, uh, if you, um, that those types of things would um, lend themselves very much toward qualitative research. If you're also um, interested in looking at infrequent events, uh, infrequent events, the example here is weeping or uh, I've done some work, work on therapy self-disclosure, again, that doesn't happen all that often. So that's, um, that, that, those are uh, good ideas, good research questions that would lend themselves toward a qualitative design. Uh, another element there is topics that have not been previously explored and or for which there are no measures. Again, those, that's perfect territory for qualitative research as well. We don't know a whole lot about this. We don't have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of information. So that might lead you very appropriately to a qualitative design. Um, beyond psychotherapy, PT psychotherapy, qualitative research can be used and has been used in uh, educational venues, um, in nursing. Uh, there are a lot of qualitative researchers in the nursing field, and the social sciences as well also are very um, frequent users of qualitative research. Okay, moving specifically to uh, the steps of CQR. 
So I'm kind of shifting from the overview contextual background now to, okay, what's CQR do? What does that look like? Um, the, the steps in bold on, this, on these particular slides are those, or on this slide, are those that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking uh, with you all today. Um, but I just sort of want to put those steps in context themselves. In terms of data collection, the first step is to develop your interview protocol to develop and pilot at that. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, once you have your protocol, then you conduct and record your interviews, you transcribe the interviews, you send the transcripts to the participants to make sure that you have actually accu accurately captured what they said. So that's the data collection piece. In terms of the data analysis, uh, there are really two, uh, two phases of the data analysis with some steps or, fa or step stages within them. Um, in the within case data analysis, the first two steps are the domaining and the core ideas. And then once you finally look across case uh, for your data analysis, that's the cross analysis. Auditing occurs at each of those two stages. Again, I'll walk through that in more detail in just a little bit. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on right now is the interview protocol, and then the domaining, the core ideas, and the cross analysis. So you see how a protocol might be developed, what a protocol looks like, and then once you have the data, we'll talk about the domaining, the core ideas, and the cross analysis as the data analytic piece. The interview protocol. Um, there are two primary goals to the protocol. Uh, the first is to develop rapport because just as is in true in therapy, if you don't have a good relationship with your participant, your, the, what, the information you're going to get is going to be compromised. So you need to develop rapport. And then in terms of your specific research purposes, you need to gather very rich data. Um, so those are the two primary goals guiding the interview with protocol itself. Um, there is some, I don't know if it's controversy, but there are differences of opinion in terms of how much uh, the existing literature should be reviewed before you uh, start into your study, before you develop your protocol. In CQR, the tradition really is, yes, to review the literature um, so that you're aware of what exists out there in the literature, what the holes are, what the gaps are, what do we not yet understand. Um, and also you want to know what are the assumptions that are currently existing within the literature. So because what you want to do is really build on the existing literature, avoid any errors in that literature, and be able to add to the literature. So for, exam, uh, for example, um, an earlier study I did was on, uh, I mentioned earlier about the client's experience of terminating therapy. Well, in our review of the literature, we found that there's a, a, fair, there's a good chunk of theory about the termination experience, but there's actually little empirical research on this phenomenon. Most of what existed was, from the therapist's point of view, and more specifically from psychodynamic therapist point of view. So that, in our review of the literature, that allowed us to get a sense of, okay, what's out there? Um, and then how can our study complement, add to, or extend that particular, that particular literature base? So what that led to in our particular example was that we wanted the client's perspective, and we did not want clients who had, uh, we don't want clients solely from a psychodynamic uh, therapy experience. We wanted to really open that up. So that allowed us to build upon what was already existing within the literature, um, to fill the gaps in the literature and to advance the knowledge. The other thing to, to bear in mind as you're developing your protocol, or even thinking about your protocol, is use your own personal experience and your own expertise to develop those questions. Um, you may have experience with a particular phenomenon of interest. You may have done some other, uh, other research on that. I mean, build upon your own expertise and your own experience. And also ask yourself, what are you curious about? Um, when I'm working with students who are trying to figure out what they want to do for their dissertations, and they have sort of a general topic area to find, a question I'm constantly asking them is, so what are you most curious about? What do you most want to know? And really try to have them narrow that down, focus that down to a pivotal, a crucial, you know, two or three questions. And those may end up being their research questions that guide their, their dissertation. And the same type of thing would hold true for a CQR study. Um, and the other thing to think about here is what have you experienced, either as a client or a therapist or a supervisee or a supervisor. That's all great fodder for this idea of, okay, given my own experiences, what, am I, what do I want to learn? What am I curious about? What am I passionate about? What have I experienced in any of these roles that I really want to get some more information about? What you hope to end up with then is um, an interview protocol that consists of about eight to ten open-ended questions, planned questions. Um, 
And each of those questions will often be, you'll follow those up with more unscripted probes that will allow you to deepen and elaborate based on um, what the participants have given you so far. So you, know, you, you sort of plan out ahead of time your eight to 10 core key questions, knowing that you're gonna do a lot of uh, following up, a lot of additional probes based upon what the participants are giving you to sort of open up, explore even in more detail and depth on what they're telling you. The interview protocol itself usually consists of about three sections. Um, in the opening section, uh, you start with some warm-up questions, rapport building questions. Um, for example, we were, um, right now we're finishing up a study looking at supervisees, um, internal representations of their supervisors. So in that particular study, one of the opening questions was of the supervisees were the participants. So one of the questions was, tell us about your supervision experience overall. We just wanted a sort of a global, easy, gentle, warm-up type of question. Got them comfortable with the interview process, um, got them beginning to sort of talk about the supervision experience. So that really is the opening section. Then really in the middle section, which is the heart of the interview, um, those are your really more focused, evocative questions which really get at the phenomena that you are most inter interested in getting at. Often in the research I do, I'll ask uh, participants to talk about a specific event, or sometimes two specific events, let's say a positive one and a negative one. Um, in, in the therapist self-disclosure studies, for example, I would often ask uh, participants who are clients to talk about a time when their therapist disclosed, and they thought, thought that that was a helpful disclosure. And I would also ask them to talk about a time when their therapist disclosed and it was not so helpful and maybe had some harmful effects. So in that middle section of the interview, and again, I'll show you an example later on, that's really the juice, the meat, or if you're vegetarian, the potatoes of your interview, where you really want to get at, that's the heart of the interview protocol. Um, and often it can be a really good idea to have your participants quote on, uh, focus on a very specific event. Um, the, the CF was supervisor there, in another study we looked, um, Again, on supervision relationship, we were interested in having folks talk about a specific conflict they had with the supervisor and how that conflict was resolved. The last part of uh, the interview then is are some closing questions um, where it, it's sort of in the, in the same way that you sort of gradually opened up when the ending uh, section you want to sort of gra gradually close things down. Again, for the supervisees, um, internal representations of their supervisor study, we asked them, one of the closing questions was, well, what, what advice would you give to other supervisees who have this experience? So it's out of their, it's out of, they're not talking about a specific example of an internal rep, but it's more like reflecting after the fact. What advice would you give for other supervisees? We often will ask folks um, how it felt to talk about this experience. Kind of going back to the example I mentioned earlier about the, the student who was told that he, she would have to walk across the burning sands of hell. It was really important for us to talk with that participant about how it was to do this interview, to talk about what clearly was a difficult and painful experience. And so it allows us really to check in, make sure that, you know, how they're doing after having talked about um, some, of those, some of those experiences. The other important thing to bear in mind as you're developing the protocol is to, is to consult with content, with content experts um, to ensure that you really are adequately and thoroughly covering the topic area. So folks in your professional networks, advisors, um, mentors, other faculty members, whoever it might be, folks who really know that phenomena well, run your protocol by them and say, are we, have we got it here? Are, we, are there pieces of this phenomena that we're missing? And that's certainly a, a regular part of our process. Um, what we also do is, is pilot the protocol, um, usually two times, could be even more than that. Um, and then the purpose of that pilot is to couple purposes, to make sure that you know, you're, you're accurately um, and completely, thoroughly sort of capturing the phenomena, are there questions you should have asked but you're not yet asking, so you can add those into the protocol. Because what you'll do um, with the pilots is you'll ask them for feedback. You know, were the questions clear? Um, were there any redundancies in the questions? If so, you can get rid of those. Were there parts of your experience that the questions don't yet get at? Are there questions we should have asked but didn't ask? So that's one of the, the good things about doing pilots. The other thing about a pilot is it allows the researchers to get comfortable with the pilot, um, to, to sort of get a sense of confidence and confidence with that particular protocol so that when they go to interview the, the quote, real participants, they have a sense of ease with the protocol and, they have a, and ease and familiarity with it. Um, so that's, doing pilots is a really vital part of the process. It allows you to really uh, 
finalize and revise uh, the protocol because the protocol is your main instrument to gather your data. So it's huge um, to get a lot of good information from that. And I see that some that uh, Allison's going to cut in now. So is there time for questions now? Yeah, Sarah, there's um, a few people who have a couple of questions. Okay. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The first question is um, from Ashmi, and it is, is there an ideal duration of interview? That's a good question. Um, it, it kind of varies on your study. Typically, I shoot for interviews that are about 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, less than that, my concern is that you're not really getting the rich, deep data that you want to get at. Um, more than that, um, it's not so much, it's less a concern of, oh my gosh, am I getting enough data? It's a matter of you're asking your participants to give you an hour or so of their time, and you want to make it a, a participation or realistic opportunity for them. And sometimes, you know, whether you're talking about therapists or supervisees or supervisors or clients or whatever, time is a precious commodity. Uh, so you want to be very respectful of what you're asking them to do to participate. So, I generally look for about 45 to 60 minutes or so. Allison, were there any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, there are actually a couple more. Okay. Um, this is um, from Ritsky. It says, CQR is only considered in the context of interview research. However, I thought it could also be used for case study research. Is that possible? And if yes, are a lot of adaptations necessary? And then they go on to explain, with case study research, I refer to therapy sessions as raw material for data analysis. OK. That, that's a, a big question. Um, it, as I was saying early on, most of the time it relies on interviews, but not exclusively. Um, you can do it in non-interview formats. Um, I personally have not used it for case studies. Um, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to think through this as I do this. Um, It depends, in part, I think it depends on what you mean by a case study. I mean, if you're talking about a whole course of therapy, so it's, it's actually kind of hard for me to answer that question because um, I'm not sure what the, what the asker of the question means by a case study. Um, I guess in broad terms, if you can identify, and we'll get to this later on when we talk about the domains, if you can identify common domains across the different case studies, and if you can core come up and arrive with core ideas across those domains and then engage in the cross-analysis process. Off the top of my head, I'm not, not seeing any reason why you couldn't do that, but it really depends upon how you're defining case study. Um, and that the question actually may make more sense to the person asking the question after I talk about the data analysis piece. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And the last question that we have is from Ashmi again, and it says, if you do not have a team to have consensus on the entire data, but you want to use a team to audit random parts of the data, which qualitative research strategy would you come, would come closest to CQR? Boy, uh, well, I guess I would have concerns about only having part of the data randomly audited, um, I, I, because I was sort of born and raised in the CQR tradition. So um, that, that's kind of my first reaction that, you know, if you're going to engage in auditing, my, you know, I, would, I would encourage you to have all of the data analysis audited. Um, many of the, of the qualitative research methods that I'm familiar with um, do use teams in various forms, but not all of them. Um, you know, coming to mind, I mean, with CQR, using a team is by definition an inherent part of the process. Um, I've known, uh, I've seen um, studies that have used, used phenomenology, for example, that have used a single researcher. Um, some grounded theory can use a single researcher as well, although most grounded theory does involve a team. Um, but that's kind of what comes to mind at this point. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and that was, that's it for our questions right now. So. Okay. All right. Well, let's continue okay. launching through them. Okay. Here's an example, uh, looking at the previous slide, sort of things to consider about the interview protocol itself. 
Here's an example of an actual protocol that we used in the termination study. And again, this was a study looking at how did, um, it was a study of clients' experience of a, of a therapy termination. Um, so again, you can see it, it's sort of six big questions, but sort of kind of eight to ten questions or so total overall. And we began by asking just asking the participants, tell me about your relationship with your therapist. Sort of an a easy, gentle, warm-up opening question that gradually sort of gently gets them into the, to the, to the interview itself and also hopefully to, uh, builds that uh, relationship between researcher and participant. And it still is relevant to our particular topic. We want to know a little about the therapeutic relationship before we actually ask about the termination. So that was the warm-up question. Then we had a second warm-up question, again, to provide us some of the context for what they would be talking about in the termination um, experience. We wanted them to tell us a little about the goals they had for the therapy and their sense of how much progress they made, they made on those goals in the therapy. So those are really our two warm-up questions. The crux of the interview, though, were, was that question three with its uh, six subs, because in this part of the interview, this is where we really wanted them to talk in really deep, juicy detail about the termination experience. So here were the, the main questions there. First we asked was, how did the termination occur? And we're, what we were trying to get at there was kind of the, the when, the why, the who initiated, the how, the how far in advance, those types of things. We didn't lock them into talking only about what was in the parentheses there, but those were just sort of the, the stimulus probes, the stimulus follow-up questions when we wanted them to talk about sort of, well, how did it come about? Um, our, our concern was that we didn't have those things in the parentheses and we just asked the question sort of, how did it occur? Participants wouldn't really even know kind of where to jump in there, so we provided them with some initial stimuli there, but we also had lots of follow-up probes to clarify their responses to those parenthetical uh, follow-ups. The next main question there was, what were your reactions to the termination? What types of thoughts, feelings, behaviors um, came about as a result of the termination? We then wanted to know how the termination affected you, the client, how did it affect the therapy, and how did it affect the relationship with the therapist? We then were interested in finding out how, if at all, did you actually talk about the termination with your therapist? either you know, as it was being planned or as it was literally happening or you know, in what context did any conversation about the termina termination itself happen. We were, th were then curious about how, if at all, did you wish the termination had gone differently? Um, just to get a sense of, you know, given that the termination was happening or had happened by the time they participated in the interview, were there things that they wish had happened differently about it? And then we also wanted to know how did the termination experience affect your feelings about pursuing therapy in the future. So that was really the, the heart of the interview there was that question three with its six subs, talking about a specific experience of terminating with a, or terminating from a therapist. And then sort of the closing questions, we wanted to know a little bit of demographic information about uh, the participant and about the therapy. Then we want to know why they choose to participate in the research. It's always an interesting question. Um, you know, why on earth did you choose to, to give us an hour of your time? We're grateful that you did, but we're just kind of curious. What, what prompted you to say, to say yes to our recruitment? And then we also want to know, well, how was this interview experience for you? Um, so that's an example of one uh, protocol that was, in fact, used in a study. Okay. Now I'm shifting gears from, from data collection now to the data analysis. And as I mentioned a couple slides ago, um, we first start with within case data analysis. Um, and in this case, we're looking at the trees. Uh, um, and at a later point, we'll talk about across, days date, across case data analysis. And at that point, we are looking at the forest. But we first start with the trees. Um, and the first step of data analysis in CQR is domaining, and this really is more of an organizational step. We're trying to come up with domains, which is a topic area um, that the data really fall into. For example, um, the Q3 study, which is the, was the study on um, international students' experience of being an international student. These were all counseling site students. Uh, so the domains, some of the domains that emerged for that particular study were, what were, some, were the challenges of being an international student? That's what IS is advantages of being an IS, and unique needs of being an IS. So there's really, we're not doing a whole lot of interpretation at this step, it really is just sort of an organizational step. We're trying to figure out what are the topic areas into which these data fall. 
Um, once we've uh, come up with a preliminary, or, or what we do at that point then is we create a domain list, um, which again is developed inductively from the first view transcript. You continue to revise it until it's stable, and you're, all, and you're tweaking the domain list really probably throughout about the first third, maybe to a half of your data analysis. More specifically, what does that look like? Um, what we do and, and the teams that are working with me is individual, individual team members will first um, look at a transcript on their own. So, for example, if I'm reading through a transcript, I'm just kind of jotting down what are the main topic areas that seem to emerge from these data, and I'm making a list on my own. Then, when we meet as a team, each of us comes in with our own preliminary lists, and we kind of discuss what are the domains each of us came up with. Um, and in many cases, there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of agreement in terms of the domains. But I may see a domain that somebody else doesn't see, or somebody else may see a domain that I don't see. So we essentially, we discuss and come to consensus on that initial list of domains. And so we're looking at what do we want to title those domains, and what type of data do we think should go into each of those domains. So that's the preliminary domain list based on you know, the first transcript or two. Um, then we'll go using that initial domain list. We'll actually domain more cases to see how well that initial domain list holds up. If we're reading our third transcript, for example, and some new domains are popping up, we know we need to revise our initial list. Or if we're reading our third transcript and really the domains from that initial list are, are holding up, then we can have pretty good confidence that, okay, this is going to be a workable domain list for the rest of the cases. Um, if, it does hold, if it doesn't hold up, then you, can, you continue to revise the domains until they do hold up. Once it does hold up, then you use this to then go back and formally domain all of the cases in your study. Um, what that then means is you're assigning chunks of data to one or more domains. Um, and just the practicalities of this, it's just a lot of cutting and pasting on the computer where you're pulling chunks of data and you're plopping, into, plopping them into a particular domain. So that's what I mean that it's an organizational step. It's not really an interpretation step. If you find, though, that you're plopping the same chunk of data into, um, if you're doing a lot of what's called double or triple coding, plopping into you know, two or three um, domains and that that's happening with a lot of data, then that's probably a signal that you need to go back and revisit your initial domain list because you may have redundant domains. Um, and as an example of that, we did a study on supervisor self-disclosure. That's what SRSD stands for. And we found we were putting a lot of data into both domains having to do with precipitant and context. And we realized, OK, those are overlapping. They're redundant, so we just collapse those, collapse those domains together. So the domain list is, a, is an evolving list. Um, you hope you know, about a third to halfway through, it's pretty well set. But don't be surprised if later on um, you need to do some collapsing or combining of domains. It's not, not fatal. Uh, it's just something you just need to, to be mindful of as you go through the, the data analysis process. OK, the next. Um, step of the data analysis, again, we're still within cases, we're still looking at trees, is coming up with the core ideas. And this really is the first interpretive step. It's no longer just organizational. This is the first time when you really are make, beginning to make sense to interpret the data. So what's a core idea? It basically is a summary or a paraphrase that captures the essence or essentially the core of the participant's words. Um, and again, the process we do here is similar to that for Domini. Uh, we'll all start on a case together, um, and we'll develop the core ideas initially as a group. We'll continue that process, process until everybody feels secure in creating those core ideas. So particularly if they're new folks on the team, you want to make sure that um, if they've not had experience with CQR, they, you want to make sure that they understand what coring means and what that looks like and, and how to do it. So we'll do things together as a team. Uh, develop the course as a group, and then continue until everyone feels OK with that. At that point, then, we'll divide the remaining cases among the team uh, for initial development of the core ideas. Um, so for example, in a study I'm working on right now, um, I did three of the interviews. Uh, each of the other participants on the team did three of the interviews. So let's say there are 12 interviews. I would take responsibility for developing the, the core ideas on all the cases that I interviewed. And the other team members would, would take responsibility for developing the initial core ideas on all the, the cases that they interviewed. Um, so it's kind of a divide and conquer. 
But again, remember in a, several slides ago I talked about uh, triangulation or, or the, the internal audit on the team. Um, we go through that process here as well. So let's say I'm doing, it's one of my cases I interviewed. I will develop the initial course for that particular case. I'll send that out to each member of my team. The team then, each member of the team on his or her own reviews um, the core ideas that have been sent to them. And they will comment, you know, where do they think I've missed things? Uh, where have I been redundant? Where have I not been clear? How would they core something differently? So all types of feedback are welcome and needed. Um, and then in the next meeting, we'll sit down and we'll talk through what changes are they proposing to those, in, to those initial cores. That really is the internal audit. And again, as I mentioned earlier about the team constitution, that allows multiple voices to be present as we begin to understand those data, multiple perspectives. Um, and, you know, hopefully it also fosters that really egalitarian um, communication across all members of the team. Um, when you have confusion or when there's disagreement, then you do return to the original data, in that case either to the transcript or, the, to, or to the interview itself to resolve that confusion or disagreement. Um, one of the things the team needs to do in terms of this process is also develop consensus regarding how detailed do they need to be. Um, and that's a, that's a process that each team goes through in the early stages where, you know, do you, is it sufficient to say, the session ran over time, or do you need to say that the session ran over by 10 minutes? And that's an individual call idiosyncratic to each study. There may be some reasons where, for some studies, where it's like, yeah, I need to know that 10 minutes in, so, in other sessions or in other studies, that 10 minute chunk of time may not be all that important. So you can just kind of say, well, it ran over time. The audit, uh, the auditor reviews the consensus version. The consensus versions essentially is for each case. It's your data plopped into their domains, um, and then the core ideas that, that, that distill those data. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. You send that document to the auditor, the auditor reviews it, and the auditor's looking not only at your core ideas, but also have you accurately placed the data into the correct domains. So this is the first time they're really looking at are the, how are the domains working? Are the data where they should be? Are they in the right domains? And do the core ideas thoroughly and accurately capture what has been communicated by the, by the participant. The auditor sends uh, the audit back to the team, the team discusses the audit, and then makes appropriate changes based on that audit. Okay, so again, uh, as an example, pulling again from the termination study, this is clients' experience of terminating from their therapist. Um, there were 12 domains. The first seven, why did the person uh, seek this therapy? What previous therapy experience did they have? How did they find their termination therapist? How, what was their relationship like with their termination therapist? What were their goals for therapy? What was the content or process of the therapy as, as a whole? Just trying to get a sense of what was the therapy all about? Not related to termination, but what was the, what was the, what was the focus of therapy? How did the therapy affect the participant, be as participant? And then number eight really gets at the heart. So one through seven are sort of contextual background types of things. Number eight really gets at the heart here in terms of the termination itself. And so what we wanted to do is what preceded the termination? What was the ter how did the termination itself sort of happen? How did it transpire? And then we were also very interested in the effects of the termination. So we want to know how did the termination affect the participant? How did it affect the therapy relationship? How did it affect the participants' thoughts about future therapy um, or on that, ther on that particular therapy itself? What, if any, type of relationship did the participant have with the therapist after termination? And given that the participants in the study were all therapists themselves, we wanted to know how this termination experience affected their approaches to termination with their own clients. We also want to know what they would change about that termination. And sometimes data don't fit into all the domains neatly, so there's always this sort of catch-all other there. And you can see some overlap between the interview protocol and the domains, and that's to be expected. We don't impose the interview questions on the domains. Instead, remember, we sort of let the, let the domains emerge organically, inductively from the data in the transcripts. But it's absolutely to be expected that there'd be some overlap between the questions you asked and the domains that emerge. 
And then once we got outside of the specific incident there, we were also interested in what, if any, post-termination contact folks had with the therapist, uh, any prior experience or training they had about termination, and again, we want to know why they participated and how the interview affected them. So at this point, Allison, actually, Allison, in a couple slides, maybe it would be a good time for questions, but let me just kind of show this example here. Uh, so here is an example, again, from the termination study. The domain is in bold, and the transcribed data um, are in the non-bold immediately below. Um, so the domain here is previous therapy experience. And one participant talked about saying, I've, I've not been in therapy since I've been a graduate student, so it was a number of years. Another said, I've done previous courses of therapy, but they had not been focused on my abuse stuff. They were focused more on general emotional deprivation that I'd had in my life really hadn't focused specifically on the abuse and how that had affected me. Another participant said, my grad school therapist was really very gifted, was incredibly helpful to me, it was a great experience, I got a lot out of it, really made a lot of progress, life improved, symptoms improved, I'd had a past history of knowing what therapy could be. So again, these are just, um, this is from one participant, um, all that that participant said about previous experience in therapy. So this, this, what you're seeing there is the raw data from the transcript, transcript itself. Three different chunks of data from one participant that was coded into this domain of previous therapy experience. So what you see in bold here then are the core ideas that were um, developed based on those data. So the non-bold below is again the exact um, data from the transcript that was on the previous slide. What's above in the bold are the cores that were developed as a result of those uh, of that transcribed data. So prior experience as grad student was 20 years ago, focused on general emotional deprivation rather than history of abuse. Grad school therapist was gifted and helpful. Therapy was a great experience. He made lots of progress and life and symptoms improved. So had past history of knowing what therapy could be. So that essentially is an example of how we go from the raw data of the transcript, one case, within one case in one domain, raw data of the transcript to the core ideas, which seek to capture the essence or the core of those raw data. Okay, Allison, are there any questions at this point? Hi there. Yes, there are. Um, there is one question, and what we're going to do this time for the questions is unmute the person's mic. Okay. So that they can ask the question directly, and um, and that way, if they need to follow up in any way, that they, they can. That so sounds good. So the first question comes from Nicholas Morrison, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute his mic, and then he can ask you directly. Okay. Nicholas, are you there? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Hi, great. Nicholas. Hi there. Um, well, thank you for, for giving this talk. I, I really enjoy CQR. Um, I use it for my undergraduate thesis. Uh, I'm working on a study right now. Um, and one of the questions I had was, I know that grounded theory relies um, on meaning units until saturation has occurred. So um, using the example that you gave, um, the session ran over uh, might be captured in interview one, um, and then it's not um, coded again um, until it's identified in future transcripts. Um, in CQR, uh, would you continue to code core ideas uh, that are very similar across transcripts? So, for example, would the session ran over and we ran late in session be coded as two distinct core ideas? Within one case, you mean? Uh, uh, no, so like across like two transcripts. Um, well, it kind of depends upon the words that the, each participant used. So, if, you know, in, in participant one, if they said the session ran over, that our core would probably say something like session ran over. Um, in participant two, let's say they their words were session ran late, we would probably code that as or core that as session ran late. But those would probably end up when we get to the cross analysis. Those would probably end up in the same type of category. Okay. So ultimately, it sounds like it wouldn't it wouldn't matter too much about the distinct wording because they would end up going together, is that correct? Yeah, I mean that, that because that's a very subtle nuance between rain over and running late, that's, you know, in the, what they would end up, they would end up in the cross analysis in a category that might reflect about, you know, extensions of time, I mean that it's sort of hard to say, um, but, you know, right. yeah, those would end up um, in the same category in your cross analysis, yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sure. 
Anyone else, Allison, or should I keep rolling? Okay. And, um, well, let me see. If I, let's just a few moments. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Just raise your hand quickly. Okay, sir. I think we're good to go. You can keep rolling. Okay. All right. All right, so that's the domain and core ideas. Now, we finally get to the forest, and this is the fun part. Um, the first two steps of the data analysis, the domain and core ideas, are, with, are done within cases, so a, literally a case-by-case -case analysis of the data. In the cross-analysis, as the name would suggest, we're finally looking across cases. So we've, we're out of the trees, and now we're looking at the whole forest. Um, and the purpose here is to really to identify the common themes, and we call those categories, across cases within each domain. So it is a much more macro, it's a different level of thinking, more macro level of thinking, it's a shift in lenses, and I personally find it a whole lot more fun. Um, what you need to do before you do that is create a document that lists all core ideas for each case within each domain. And I sort of... Uh, historically refer to that document in my studies as the beast because it's, it's sort of a big document. Um, so you literally are, you know, domain one, um, case by case, all the core ideas for across all your participants. So if you in domain, let's say you have 12 participants in your study. Here's domain one. I'm going to have 12 sets of core ideas all having to do with domain one. Each set of core ideas coming from a particular and a distinct participant. So that's the beast document. Then what you're doing, and you do this domain by domain, you're looking for themes, commonalities across cases within the domain. And strategically, I usually try, and particularly if I have uh, folks who are new at CQR on my team, I try to start with smaller domains just to kind of get my head around it, to get my, the hang of it, because it, it is a very different conceptual process to do the cross analysis than it has been to do the previous two steps of the data analysis. So we'll start with something that's small and manage, we'll just try to get the hang of it. And again, the process here is similar to what it was in the core idea process, well, where we'll do a couple of easy manageable domains together as a team to make sure that everybody understands the process. And then what we'll do is, again, sort of a divide and conquer, we'll divide the remaining domains um, equitably among the folks on the primary research team where each of us is taking responsibility for an equal number of domains. And then let's say, you know, I'm responsible for domain six. Um, I would then send my initial cross-analysis, so my initial developing of the categories, to the other members of my team. They would then individually um, review what I have sent to them, looking for places where they disagree, places where they might have done something different, places where they think I missed something, places where they agree, whatever. We each then come to that next meeting and we talk about um, the initial cross-analysis and what changes they would suggest to that cross-analysis. Eventually re, um, coming to consensus in terms of what, what we think that, how, what cross-analysis categories we think best reflect the data. We then, as we did with the consensus version with the uh, core ideas before, we send that out for auditing of each domain as it's completed. Core ideas, yes, they may go into more than one category because that may make sense. Um, it's also not unusual at this point to see some changes in the domains and categories. Um, you may feel like it, it suits your understanding of the data best to merge some categories at this point, to collapse some things to categories, or to, yeah, to collapse some categories together, that's fine too. Um, your whole point in this stage is to really to begin to see the big picture and to want to tell the most accurate and most compelling story of what story do these data tell. So you then at that point may need to tweak some categories. Um, and that, you know, again, that's not a problem. It's just a matter of things you need to do to best and most accurately reflect your data. At the end, and I'll show you an example of a cross-analysis in a minute, but at the end of that, um, in CQR, we are interested in representativeness, representativeness of categories, and that's something that not all qualitative research seeks to do. Um, but in CQR, we do want to know, well, how, common, how commonly did this theme emerge? So uh, general categories are categories that emerge in all or all but one participant. Typical are those that emerge in at least half. Variant are, mo um, are categories that emerge in at least two and, and up to half. And then if you have a, a larger sample, let's say I think it's usually above 15 or so, you may have a rare category. Um, and so rare kind of, you, you subdivide the variant. What, it used to be a variant category into variant and rare, but probably more detail than you need at this point. But essentially, yeah, in CQR we are looking for representatives of categories. So what does this actually look like? 
Well, this is, again, back to the termination study. Um, the domain here is how the person found the termination therapist. What we have here are the core ideas for all of the cases, and this is spanning across two slides, so I'll walk this through with you. But we have the core ideas for all of the cases that fell into this particular domain of how they found the termination therapist. EE1 refers to the initials of one of the researchers on the team. That was his first case. And in this case, we actually didn't get data about how they found the termination therapist. You, you hope not to do that too often, but sometimes there's some domains when you just don't get all the data. Um, but you know, I kind of show this up here as a, oops, try not to do that. You, you, it's, it's best to have data about all of your, all of your domains. But in EE1, there were no data. EE2, um, the participant had seen the therapist while completing a master's degree. Participant had also contacted the therapist after um, a couple of years for continued counseling. EE3, participant chose the therapist because the therapist wrote uh, her, the, his or her dissertation about the experience of being a foreigner in a new country, um, just as the, as the participant was. So the work of this therapist felt relevant to the participant, and the participant felt the therapist would understand the participant's experiences. NA1, so this is the first case for another researcher. Uh, the core idea is here. I started seeing the therapist for family therapy when I was 10 years old, began seeing uh, the therapist later on for individual therapy when I was in high school. NA3, again, no data there. NA4, participant does not rem remember how they found the termination T because the participant was dissociated and experiencing PTSD symptoms at the time. But the participant knew because the therapist told the participant how the participant's self-referral occurred. Participant was also aware of the therapist um, because of a prior professional contact knew the therapist previously through the participant's graduate training. Participant had attended a seminar led by the therapist. And here we have, again, same domain, um, but these are just the additional cases in this study and their core ideas about how they found the termination therapist. SH1, therapist was highly recommended by people the participant knew or worked with on internship, um, and a friend acquaintance was also seeing the therapist. As H2, participant was told that the therapist was the best person to go to, who really understood the participant's diagnosis. As H3, uh, participant continued with the therapist that the participant had seen earlier when the uh, participant was 18. Participant had difficult time adjusting to college. Mom happened to be a teacher, asked the school counselor, school psychologist to recommend someone who happened to live up the street. Participant felt the therapist would have understood the therapist or participant's history in the community, would make it easier for the, for the participant to get going and be comfortable in therapy. SK1 wanted to see PA psychoanalytic therapist because that was the tradition in which the participant had been trained and participant thought that, that would be a, the best approach to her concerns. This participant interviewed several potential therapists and finally found a training analyst at a local institute. SK2, the therapist did not reject the participant because of the participant's heavy trauma history as other therapists had. Um, uh, and this participant also was very active in finding the therapist interviewed more than a dozen potential therapists. SK3, no data there. So just as you read through these, or, or I read through them with you, I'm imagining you're beginning to see some potential categories emerge here in terms of how the termination therapist was found. Okay. And so here are the categories that this particular team came up with, or th th that emerged in this particular study. One of the categories, the first was that the participant had previously worked with a therapist in therapy. So what's underlined and in bold there, that is the first category. It's a variant category because it did not reach the threshold um, of TIBL, so there are only three cases there. And what's listed underneath there are the core ideas for the cases that fell into that category. So they're essentially the core ideas that justify that category. So previously worked with therapy, NA1, he talks about family therapy and individual therapy earlier. EE2 had seen them earlier while completing the master's degree. SH3 had seen them when they were younger, uh, 18 years old, college, stuff like that. So all three of those sets of core ideas fill into that category. Second category, there have been a professional or a personal referral to the therapist. SH1, others had highly recommended the therapist. A friend and acquaintance also recommended the therapist. SH2, a uh, participant was told um, that the therapist was the best person to go to for this diagnosis. SH3, 
Uh, the referral here was, was uh, again, professional, the school counselor, school psychologist, they recommended the summit. So again, those are the core ideas that justify, um, that, that created, that led to that particular category of professional and personal referral, also a variant category. The last variant category here, one, was the idea that the participant had, act, had been very actively seeking the therapist or in, in some, and had actually interviewed the therapist. And there were four cases here, again, not reaching the threshold for typical, so it's still a variant. But again, with NA4, um, it was a self-referral. Uh, the participant was aware of the person through a prior professional contact, sought out that person. EE3 uh, chose the therapist because of the, the um, therapist's experience in, in, the, in the particular issue that the participant was wrestling with, SK1. So I'd had a psychoanalytic therapist, interviewed several. SK2 interviewed more than a dozen potential therapists. Um, so that sort of demonstrates uh, that particular category as well. Almost to the end here. After you've done your cross-analysis, creating a table is a very effective and efficient way to present the findings um, in a real user-friendly, easily, easily accessible, easily graspable format. Um, you list the domains in their logical order, categories in descending frequency order. So here's an example of that. Um, this is again from the termination study. Um, this is part of the table, not the whole table. There was no way to fit the whole thing on there. Um, the, the information that's in italic are the categories. The domains are non-italicized. Um, and you'll see here that we split, um, that there were folks in the, the participants who talked about um, positive termination experiences and some who talked about problematic termination experiences. So we really did a split, split cross analysis there, which does sometimes happen and is sometimes the most effective way to present your, your findings. But so the domain here was what were the concerns addressed in the therapy? And we had one, two, three, four, five, six categories that emerged there. And the formatting got a little wonky for that first one, sorry about that. In general, um, with those who talked about positive terminations, they were talking about their general mental health concerns. Those who were talking about problematic terminations, that was a typical category there. So still pretty frequently across both sets of the split. Um, but some difference, general to typical, positive versus problematic. Um, for those who had positive experiences, again, a general category was the idea that they were talking about relationship concerns in the therapy. It was only typical in the problematic termination experiences. In the positive termination experiences, intrapsychic concerns were typically discussed in the therapy, only variantly discussed in the problematic termination experiences. In the positive termination experiences, stress, coping, and trauma were typically addressed in the therapy, also typically addressed in the problematic termination experiences. In the uh, positive termination experiences, uh, typically, Participants talked about anxiety and depression in therapy. Only variantly did they do that in the problematic experiences. And in the positive termination experiences, grief and loss didn't emerge at all in the positive termination uh, findings and were typically discussed in the problematic termination experiences. So that just gives you a, a partial table example of once you finish the whole cross analysis, how do you present these findings in a very easy, accessible, user-friendly way? That's uh, pretty much it in terms of my prepared slides and everything. If you want, uh, I pulled a lot of the data here, a lot of the examples from the termination study, and there's a citation for that if anyone wants to look at, for example, look at the whole table or look at how the specific examples I pulled in, uh, how they fit in the context of the larger study. So that's the citation if anyone wants to go poking around in there. And that's all I got. Allison, questions? Sarah, thank you so much. That was, that was a really great presentation, and um, so thank you. We do have um, one question so far, but um, please feel free to send your questions in. And this question comes from Robin. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is unmute her mic, and she can ask you her question directly. Okay. Hello? Hey, Robin. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this. This was very, very informative. Um, I just have, I just have a question regarding writing up the results. Yeah, uh, and I was wondering how you make decisions regarding the categories to discuss in the text of the results, because um, obviously you can't include all of it. 
Um, I noticed that it's usually based on the higher frequencies, like general or typical, and mm -hmm. the rest is in tables. But what if you get a lot of interesting results that are variant and you don't have any general things to discuss, for example? Yeah, um, it, that's actually a decision that, that I have to make differently with every single study. Um, so it's hard to sort of come up with an overall general rule about it. You know, in some studies I have, I've put in the table, I've put the domains and categories and actually some illustrative core ideas. And I've done a very more overview cursory discussion in the, the body of the manuscript. Um, in other studies, I've had tables that had none of the illustrative core ideas and I've done more of a meaty discussion in the results section. So it, it really kind of depends on you know, what you and or your team decide is really the best way to, to present your findings. Um, you know, I wish I could give you sort of you know, the, the standard answer, but there really isn't one. It's, it's kind of idiosyncratic to each study. Um, the second part of your question is you know, what if you have a lot of juicy findings in the variants? Well, that actually would potentially raise a concern for me if, if you find that, the, that, that you're doing your cross-analysis, that, that you really don't have many um, general or typical findings, that's something when I would actually you know, encourage you and your team to go back and say, I wonder if our findings are stable yet. Because if the, predominant, if the predominance of our categories are variant, then that tells me that there's, you haven't yet reached that point where there's a lot of stability in the findings. You have lots of you know, sort of a, div a divergence in your findings. So that, you know, were I in that circumstance, one of the questions I'd be asking myself is, do I need to collect more data so that I can really more um, confidently confirm what is the nature of this phenomenon, you know, what these findings are? Because if, if most of your findings are variant, that tells me, you know, that potentially I haven't yet reached, uh, granted theory use the term saturation, but I haven't yet reached stability or saturation in my findings. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, Allison? Okay, let me look to see if we have any more questions. We do, yes. Um, Nicholas, ha Nicholas has another question. And okay. so I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute his mic. Okay, Nicholas, are you there? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just interested to know if you are aware of any studies that uh, have reviewed the reliability um, of CQR methodology. Uh, I know that obviously the consensual component makes it much more rigorous, but um, to your knowledge, have there ever been any studies where multiple groups have uh, investigated the same phenomenon um, or anything like that to your, to your knowledge? Um. I, I can speak to that in a little bit. First of all, I mean, w w even using the word reliability, um, that's, a, that's a sort of a, a more quant-based paradigm word. Um, so in, in mm -hmm. qualitative research, we tend to use words like trustworthiness or um, uh, transferability, those types of things. But um, I'm aware of one study where there were two independent teams who analyzed the same set of data. Am I right on this? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were two, te two separate teams who analyzed the same set of data, um, and they, um, they came up with some common themes and some uh, across the two themes, but they also came up with a surprising number of things that differed. Um, and there were some other problems with the data in that study that I think, in my view, sort of explain some of the discrepancies there. But, you know, I think that that's a great question, and that that's an area that I wish um, more people would kind of take up the charge and say, okay, let me do this, because you know, as someone who submits uh, manuscripts to journals all the time, that's always a question that's raised in terms of, you know, the trustworthiness of the findings. And I think, you know, we could would strengthen, um, not so much strengthen the rigor of qualitative, qualitative research, because I think CQR, for example, is a very rigorous approach. We could sort of maybe enhance the acceptability for folks who are less familiar with it if we were able to speak more toward that type of uh, reliability or transferability type of check. But so the, the Reader's Digest answer to your question is, I'm aware of one study. I wish there were more, but I'm not aware of a whole lot more going on on that front. OK, thank you so much. Sure. OK, Sarah, we also have another question from, um, from Ashmi. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute. Hello? Okay, sorry, I just got him. Okay. 
Hello, hello? Dr. Nath. Yes. Uh, hello, thank you so much for, for this talk. It's really uh, in informative. What I wanted to ask was, uh, is it possible to analyze the categories that emerge based on the sample profile? Uh, for example, demographics or any such uh, variable? I'm sorry, can you ask your question? I'm not sure I understood you. Uh, once the categories emerge, uh, is it possible to do a comparative analysis based on, uh, say, demographics? For example, uh, okay. can, we, can we identify whether uh, you know, a, a certain categories are emerging from a particular uh, demographic within the uh, data? Yeah, you can. And that's kind of, uh, in the example I showed you earlier about the termination study, it wasn't based on a demographic split. It was based more on the experience of positive versus problematic termination. But if there's good reason for you to think, you know, I wonder if men or women are experiencing things differently. Or I wonder if people who mm -hmm. have, um, you know, who saw a cognitive behavioral therapist versus a psychodynamic therapist, you know, experiences differently. If there are important, relevant variables like that that you want to see, you know, I wonder if the same pattern is emerging across these two samples. Yes, that can be done, and it has been done. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Okay, are there any more questions? Any, if so, raise your hand. Okay, we have another one that just came through. Okay, I'm going to, and this is from Rosaline. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your mic. Okay, Rosaline, you can go ahead with your question. Rosaline, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay. Well, it doesn't seem that she can hear us. Could you go ahead and type your question in the question box? Okay. Well, we're waiting for that question to come through. A question that we have, Sarah, is um, from your experience, what um, are some major pitfalls for novices who are learning this technique or just starting out using this technique? Hmm. Uh, major pitfalls. Um, I don't know if I would call this a pitfall, but I think you know some of the learning curves. Um, first is doing the interview um, because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that that's your main data gathering instrument. And so if you don't really gather rich, detailed data, um, that's going to compromise, you know, the, the findings you can come up with much later down the road. So I think it's really important um, to practice doing the interviews and to practice doing, the, you know, doing the interview as a whole, to practice doing the follow-up probes, to make sure that you know, new folks new to the method really feel comfortable with that and, you know, know where to probe and what types of probes are helpful and and how to continue, how to probe even, you know, further probe the probes. Um, so I think it's not a pitfall, but I think it's just, it's an absolutely essential, vital part of the process. And so a lot of time, time well spent up front um, to really make sure that there's comfort and familiarity with the inter interview process can yield great rewards down the road. Um, in terms of other pitfalls, um, I don't know that I would really identify any. I, I think sometimes the conceptual leap from the within case data analysis of domains and core ideas, making the leap from that to the cross analysis sometimes is a hard leap to make. Um, but, you know, everybody eventually makes it, but it's just sort of, you know, sometimes people are more detail oriented types of thinkers and sometimes people are more big picture oriented types of thinkers, so micro versus macro. Again, not a pitfall, but just sometimes a challenge. Um, you know, it takes a little time just to kind of get your head around, okay, I've been so immersed in the trees here, and now, now finally I'm looking at the forest, and I forgot how to do that. Um, that's uh, the only other thing that comes to mind in terms of, you know, how detailed the core ideas need to be. Um, and I tend to err on the side of making them very detailed because, uh, you know, I'd rather have more data than too little data. Um, but again, different teams kind of approach that somewhat differently. And so just sort of learning the culture of your team of how detailed do the data need to be. Um, and that's something that each team just sort of negotiates and figures out among itself. But 
So that's what comes to mind in terms of responses to that. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. And um, Rosaline was able to type in her question. And okay. Is, I noticed that the examples of data were paraphrased examples, not the actual words of the participant. Can you comment on this? I've only used raw data from participants, not paraphrased by researcher. Uh, well, the core ideas um, are both paraphrased and they also do uh, pull in uh, particularly salient, juicy, raw words. So it's a distillation, it's a, it's a coring, it's a paraphrasing of the participants' words. But if there are, and, and we do try to stay as close to those words as possible. So we may not do direct excerpts of everything, but you know, if we do try to keep as many of the participants' words as possible, if they're particularly juicy phrases like the one earlier, walking across the burning sands of hell, that obviously got pulled in because that, that's probably going to find its way into the manuscript. So <laughs> um, I don't know that I would necessarily say that we do just paraphrases. I mean, even in our paraphrases, we are pulling in the participants' words. We're not um, necessarily, what, I jokingly refer to my teams about the 11th commandment, thou shalt not infer. And so, um, you know, I would much rather and do keep true to the and pull in the participants' actual words, even if I don't necessarily put everything in quotation marks as a direct excerpt. Okay, great, Sarah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are actually at time already. So, um, just want to thank everyone for participating today, and thank you, Sarah, for um, for your willingness to present on this very interesting topic. Um, was a lot of great information, so we really appreciate your willingness to do this. Well, thank you. I hope it was helpful. Oh, yes, it was very helpful. Um, so thank you, everyone. And again, this will be um, available. We have recorded this. It will be available on the SPR website within probably within the week. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope you all have a great day. Thanks.